Well, hey, good morning, everybody. So glad you're here today. Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us today. I was sitting there listening to that song and so grateful that it is true that God is stronger, that Christ is stronger. I think maybe I was struck by it more just because I think there are times in my week and in my life where I struggle with sin more often than, than I would like, certainly. And I don't have to live there. That Christ is stronger. And I can give it to him and trust him with it. And I'm just so grateful for that. So what a great way to, to take us into looking at God's word this morning. So uh, if you have your Bibles, please open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we are going to be wrapping up our series here in Timothy uh, just next week. So we've been in it for a couple months, and we have been studying basically Paul's charge to Timothy um, that really in many ways is, is still God's charge to all of us. Um, and one of the things, just for those of you who haven't been a part of all of it or have missed some of it, just for sake of review, um, sorry, I went a little too far on that. Uh, we've been talking throughout these three chapters so far about the different charges that Paul has given Timothy. From the very beginning, he was saying, hold fast in the faith, to take your faith and to pass it on, uh, that you should endure hardship, that you need to stay focused, that you need to understand the times. And then even last week, which is the first part of his last charge, Paul told Timothy that you need to stand firm. And Pastor Greg took us through what that means to stand firm, and that really we need to stand firm on Scripture. And throughout all of these different charges, throughout all these different sections of this book, we have seen these five themes sort of pop up, in and out, where Paul was telling Timothy to know where you are, evaluate your life, and know where you are, and that's okay, wherever you are, you can trust God in that. But you need to put your life in the right framework. You need to understand what your, your purpose is and, and what is true to get your identity right, that you are a child of God, that you are a servant of God, that you are not all the things that the world might tell you, that you have resources that you can draw upon whether it's God's word or whether it's the Holy Spirit or whether it is the rest of the body of Christ. And of course, there's the theme of keeping your purpose clear. And that's one of the things that we will be looking at today in this final charge of what is your purpose? What, certainly what Timothy was called to do, but what are we as believers called to do in the midst of all that? So, so we have a chance of looking at this uh, just the first few verses of chapter 4. So why don't you please pray with me and we can ask God to, to guide our time today. Father, we come before you thankful for a day that we can set aside to worship you as a body. That we can worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ to sing your praises, to sing your truths, to celebrate with our sister in Christ of the commitment that she made to you, and to celebrate what you have done in all of us who are your children. And so, Father, I pray that you will speak to us today through your word. Um, yeah, certainly, God... I recognize that even as I prepare these things, that God, you are speaking to me and convicting me as much in them as anything I, I might say today. Uh, so with that same 
power of conviction. I, God, I pray that you'll be with my words today. May they be your words. May all else be forgotten. And help us to walk away from this service changed, motivated, um, and eager to do your will. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I uh, just want to take you back a little bit. How many of you remember a time when you were in school and you were given a test? You know, a timed test. And I know some of you are teachers out there and you have the habit of doing that that awful thing to us as students. But do you remember taking those tests? You know, you might have, what is it, a 50 minutes in a, in a, in a classroom hour, and you, you know, you're told you have the whole hour to take this test, and you're going through and you're writing things down. And then at some point, as you're taking this test, you hear the teacher say, you got 10 minutes left. Now, I don't know what your response would be to that. Uh, there's probably, I can think of three different responses, and you know, there may be more. But some of us, probably when we heard that 10-minute announcement, might have said, oh my gosh, I still have, you know, 20 more question to answer. I don't have enough time, so just forget it. You know, I, I'm done. You know, I'm not even going to bother trying. Is that anybody here? No, you don't have to. Admit. Um, another group of you might have said, 10 minutes, ah, big deal. I'm already done. You know, I might just spend the time going through, make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, but the time didn't really phase you. But my guess there's probably a lot more of us, because there are times that I fit into this category quite often, when we heard 10 minutes, all of a sudden that was the, I don't know, like, that was like the starting gun right there. Like 10 minutes. All right, now I got to focus. And now we'd start writing down any answer as frantically as we could, hoping that some of it would stick. And maybe some of it would be, you know, a right answer. But realizing that you had to make the most of those last 10 minutes because for the previous 40, you were just sort of taking your time. I don't know. Does that resonate with anybody there? I, I don't know. All right, I don't know. But sometimes when we know that we are in a time crunch, you know, those of us who procrastinate or anything else, we recognize the need that we need to get to work. And as we come to chapter 4 here in 2 Timothy, we see that Paul lived his life with the clock ticking. And he wanted Timothy to do the same. You know, as Paul gives his final charge to Timothy, he prefaces it with three realities that would serve as motivation to carry out this final charge. And so let's open up 2 Timothy chapter 4. Again, if you're not there, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And let's just read the first verse of that chapter. And it says this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. So he opens up his charge with this preface about these three realities. These three things that relate to the future that should motivate Timothy to go about doing the charge that he has just given to preach the word. And those three realities are the judgment of Christ, the return of Christ, and the kingdom of Christ. So without question, Jesus is already enthroned as king of the world, in spite of what Jack from Titanic might say, king of the world. Um, Jesus is the king of the world. And eventually the day will come when we shall see his royal appearance. And at that time, each and every person here will be held to account for their sin and for their response and how they responded to Jesus. None of us know when that day will come. But we are all called to live each day, each and every minute, 
as people who are ready to give an account, to use our time wisely here on this earth with our calling and with the future in mind. Some of us may, like when we were taking a test in school, may say, the end is coming? Well, I don't know when it is. It's too hard. It, it may be too soon. We don't have enough time. Look at the mess that the world is in. There's too much to do. So we might as well just give up. Other, others of us, especially some of our older brothers and sisters in Christ, may say, I've already done my job. I'm just going to go through and make sure I have everything checked off, but there's nothing left for me to do. But hopefully most of us, when we hear that Jesus is coming back, that he is going to judge the living and the dead, and that he is going to set up his kingdom, hopefully most of us will respond to that by saying, all right, time is short, let's get to work. We got a job to do and we better get it done. And that is what Paul is saying to Timothy here. Our time is short, and we have a job to do. So let's get to work and do it. So we're reminded what the future has in store for us. And that really should motivate us to live out this charge. And so Paul goes into it a little bit further, what the charge is and how to go about doing it here in the next few verses. So if you're following along in your notes, the first blank that you had there was the motivation. And that motivation is the future. And the second point here is it's the charge. The charge is to preach the word. Verse 2 says this. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So the charge is pretty simple. It's pretty matter of fact. Timothy, preach the word. That's what I want you to do. But Paul breaks it down a little bit further in these next few verses. Uh, and and in, in saying preach the word, he answers four pretty basic, pretty common questions. He answers what, when, how, and why. So the sub points that you have there, if you're following along in your notes, uh, are those questions. And, and so the first sub point is, it's called to preach the word. And so the, th the question is, the basic question is, preach what? And simply put, it's preach God's word. Preach scripture. The usual word for the word uh, regularly refers to the Christian message. It's the announcement of Jesus Christ as Lord through his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's the fullness of what the Christian message is in light of those who have accepted Christ to be their Lord through his death, burial, and resurrection. But Paul says, preach the word. He doesn't say, preach your opinion. He doesn't say, preach pop psychology. This isn't your best life now service. He doesn't say, preach the culture. That's why we don't come here on a Sunday morning and use the pulpit as a political stump. He doesn't say, preach your feelings. You know, we don't sit here and talk about how love wins or why we should be uh, accepting of everybody's choices and lifestyles because this is the way I feel that it should be. 
Paul says, preach the word. What does God say about whatever situation that we are in? Well, I don't know how many of you have ever heard Billy Graham preach. Um, he was well known for his large crusades and his evangelistic outreaches where hundreds of people would come to Christ on any given night. But one phrase that he used to say often in his sermons was, the Bible says... And then he would go on to speak about it. The Bible says that God loves you. The Bible says how you can have peace with God. But that wasn't always the case in the way that Billy Graham preached. Early on in his ministry, he used to say something along the lines of, well, I believe that we should do X, Y, and Z. Or I believe this. And at one point, one of his mentors came to him and said, so what? Who cares what you believe? Who's Billy Graham anyway? You have no authority. What does God say about it? And Billy Graham took that advice and he incorporated that into only talking about what the Bible says on these issues. His appeal to the gospel wasn't based on the authority of his own ideas or his beliefs. He made his appeal only on the one thing that any preacher has ever had, and that is the true, inerrant, and infallible word of God. Billy Graham's message was never his message, he was only an ambassador a conduit for declaring the powerful message of Jesus Christ. And similarly, our words should point people to the saving work of Jesus that's found in the word of God. And if we find ourselves distracted and talking to the people that we come in contact with, with things other than the truth that comes from God's word, then we are missing out on the purposes that God has for us. That as believers, yeah, political things are important and political things affect our daily life. And sometimes we need to address those, right? But at the same time, our emphasis, our focus, our mission is to be talking about God's word. And the only thing that is going to change our society is what Jesus can do through a changed heart. And if we're putting the emphasis in on anything else, then we are not living out our calling as believers. And so Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, nothing else. Stick to scripture. Well, the second thing that that Paul answers in this. The second basic question is, preach when? When should I preach this? And the answer to it is simple. Preach it in season and out of season. Preach it all the time. It's a perfect metaphor because it kind of picks up a little bit on what Jesus used a number of times when he talked about the harvest. Think of Matthew 9 or John 4, where Jesus is talking about the harvest. Or even Paul used the metaphor earlier in his writings to the church at Corinth when he said, I planted, but Apollos watered, but it was God who gave, gives growth. He used sort of this, this idea of seasons. And, and when I think of that, I think of my, the planting seasons and things like that. But carrying on that metaphor, Paul says to Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Be prepared to preach God's word all of the time. 
See, sometimes when we share our faith, when we preach or proclaim the gospel of somebody, it will produce fruit. It will be that harvest season. And other times, it won't. Those are the times when you might just be planting seeds or you might just be watering seeds that somebody else planted. But you may not even know what season you're in when it comes to a person. But we need to preach all the time. Of course, the way that I just said it there, that's looking at this phrase from the perspective of the person hearing, you know, whether they are ripe and ready for harvest or whether they are just a fresh field that needs to be tilled up and planted in. But another way to look at this is from the perspective of Timothy himself as the preacher. That he is supposed to preach in season and out of season. That he's supposed to be preaching whether he feels like it or not. He's supposed to preach whether his message is going to be popular or not. He needs to preach it whether the message is going to be received or not. He needs to preach even when there is risk involved in preaching. And certainly from the text that we've looked at over these last few weeks, we've recognized that Paul has told Timothy that there is going to be risk involved. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be hard times in this. And the same is true for all of us. We need to proclaim God's good news in season and out of season. Whether we feel like it or not, whether there is risk or not, whether there's persecution, whether there's risk to our reputation, you know, certainly in this culture, we might be talking about something that the Bible says and the response almost guaranteed these days is going to be, well, you're just too narrow-minded or, or you're something phobic, whatever it may be, whatever it is of that day, transphobic or homophobic or whatever, because we might be talking about something that the Bible says about something. And so sometimes those things keep us from preaching God's word. But if we remember back in chapter 1, Paul says, join with me in suffering in the gospel. And just a few verses down there in in chapter 1, Paul says this, And it's of this gospel that I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And that is why I am suffering. That the suffering came because he was a herald of the gospel. And that is going to be true for all of us at some point if we are faithful to it. That we're not always going to have those seasons of sharing where people are going to say, yes, thank you, tell me more. It would be really nice if that was every time we shared our faith. But that's not going to be the case, right? There is suffering and hardship that can be involved in it. And sometimes that is the season, the difficult season, the out of season that we are called to do because it's, and sometimes we just, we find it hard. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll share it when I know I'm going to have a receptive audience, when it's in season. But Paul's encouraging Timothy, no, don't just do it when it's going to be easy. Do it even when it's going to be hard. What I like about this is that Paul's words here echo a little bit of the words in Peter in his first letter, where he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. Always be prepared. You know, as I thought about this idea of being prepared in season and out of season, I recognize, at least in my own life, one of the reasons why I don't share my faith as often as I would like to, one of those out-of-season times, could be those times when I am struggling with my own faith. 
when things aren't making sense to me, when God seems a little distant and I don't understand what's going on, or my feelings about what I believe don't match up with the reality that I know to be true. And so I struggle sometimes in sharing my faith and being faithful to do it in those out-of-season times. And one of the verses that has always encouraged me to go forward and to do that is in Philemon, and that's verse 6. Which, there we go. And finally, it's a small little letter, a small little book, one chapter. But in verse 6, taken out of the NIV, it says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You know, one of the reasons to preach the word, even when it's out of season, is that it helps you get a better understanding of the good things that we have in Christ. Often when we tell others about Jesus, the person who needs to hear the gospel message is you, the speaker. Somehow the Holy Spirit uses that moment to reinforce the things that we say we believe. You know, there have been times when I've shared my faith with someone and there have been two conversations going on. The first one is the the words that are coming out of my mouth to the person that I'm talking to. And the other conversation is the one that's going on in my head between me and God, or maybe sometimes just from God to me, or sometimes just to me and myself. I I don't know. Hopefully those two conversations don't get confused, because if the person hearing it, they'd be really confused what's going on in my head. But anyway, sometimes I'm sharing my faith and there are these two conversations going on. And it might go something like, you know, God loves you. And he desires to have a relationship with you. He created you to have a relationship with him. Those would be the words that are coming out of my mouth. But inside my head, I'm saying, I don't know, God. I don't feel very lovable right now. Do you really love me? And as I talk about the gospel... It gets reinforced that he does love me. That he does love me enough that he sent Jesus to die for me too. You know, as I'm sharing my faith and I talk about how sin might separate me from God. And that there's nothing I could do to earn God's favor. Or that nothing that this person that I'm sharing the gospel with can do to earn God's favor. I might be having the conversation in my own head of saying... God, I've been trying really hard, and why is this not working? Like, and God's telling me, you don't need to work harder for me to love you anymore. You can't earn my favor. And these conversations are going on. And sometimes when we share our faith, like I said, the Holy Spirit uses that conversation of just talking about what Jesus has done for that person that we are reminded once again what Jesus did for us. And we need to hear that. We need to speak the gospel to each other just as much as we need to speak it to somebody who's never heard it before. I love that hymn of, I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting like the rest. I don't know, that's not all the exact lyrics of it, but we need not just to share our faith because others need to hear it, but we need to share our faith too because we need to hear it. So he answers the question of what, he answers the question then of when, and the third thing he answers here is How? How should he preach the gospel? Continuing on there in verse 2, he says, Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 
You know, we can't be a one-trick pony when it comes to the things that we say about God. We can't be a church or an individual who only emphasizes God's love all the time. And certainly God does love us all the time. But if we were a church that only talked about God's love, we'd be missing out on the fullness that Scripture has for us. We can't be a church that only talks about the effects of sin in our life or the effects of sin in our community, whether that's abortion or the breakdown of the family or whether it's human sexuality or whether it's issues of injustice or things like that. We need to talk about those things and how Scripture speaks into them, but those can't be the only things that we talk about. Because Scripture does so many things for us. It corrects us. It moves us from going in one direction into the right direction. Sometimes it does just, it gives us that rebuke that we need to say, nope, that is not right. And we need to hear that. But we also need to hear Scripture at times that that encourages us. It's saying that, that the things that we are doing, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We do need to let the whole of Scripture speak into all of the issues that we are dealing with in life. To let Scripture do those things, to correct, rebuke, encourage. And we need to do it from up front and with each other, with patience and with instruction. I don't know how many times that even as a a parent... You know, I will tell my kid, they have to do this. You know, in the analogy, that's me laying down the, the, the law, of the scripture of Steve to my kids. But I don't do it with patience or with instruction. So they're, they're lost and they're wondering, what do I, I'm supposed to do what and how? And then when they don't do it, I come down hard on them. And Paul's saying here to Timothy, when you preach, do it with patience. Teach people how to do these things. Yeah. And even we as elders, we talk about this. We don't do this often enough. We talk about we need to share faith, but we recognize too there needs to be times when we have teachings and trainings of how we can share our faith more effectively. It would be wrong for us to be sitting up here of, oh, you have to do this and not do it with the instruction of, of how to actually do it. And so Paul answers this question, you need to teach how? Teach it with correction and with rebuking. Make sure you're encouraging. But be patient and give instructions with. They're not always going to get it the first time. And that's okay. What I like about this is how much these verses relate or are parallel to verses up in the previous chapter. And Greg went over this a little bit last week as he talked about taking a stand on Scripture. But he said this about what Scripture does. There in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that all Scripture is breathed out by God, is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. All those same concepts of what Scripture is and what Scripture is good for are the same concepts that Timothy is supposed to be using in his preaching. And again, it just goes to reinforce the fact that you're supposed to be preaching the Word, not preaching your own stuff. Preach the word, because the word is good for all these things, correcting, rebuking, for encouragement. And that's what God's word does. God's word does those things for us. And so when we are speaking to each other, when you're hearing it from up front, hopefully those are the things that you're hearing. Those are the things that you're saying to one another. 
You're using scripture to encourage someone. You're using scripture to say, no, maybe we need to make some corrections here. We're not using scripture as a weapon. We're not using it to beat somebody over the head. We're using scripture to teach and to train for all of our life and for our godliness. So then the next question that Paul answers in this as to why is, is why he should preach. Certainly he should preach the word, but why? And the next few verses tell us this. In verses 3 through 5, it says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. See, God's word doesn't change. But people's thoughts, their motives, their feelings, their circumstances, the culture around them, that all changes. And people's perspectives on right and wrong and how to deal with certain things will change as the shifting winds about us change. And Paul says we need to preach the word to others and to each other because there's going to be false teaching out there. There are going to be people speaking into your life on these issues that are not coming from the right perspective. I mean, reading these verses, I feel like we're reading something straight out of the news in terms of you know, how our, our culture has gone about answering questions of things. We certainly have people, even within churches, who are gathering pastors and preachers and influencers around them who will tell them exactly what they want to hear, who will affirm their beliefs about God or about themselves, about their own sexuality or about whatever, rather than hearing what God's word has to say about something. You know, how is it that we have ended up in a culture where the words or the phrase, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, is not only be accepted, but it is celebrated. And I think in part it's because even within the church, we have pulled people around us to say, you know, it's okay, we should be accepting that. We should be celebrating that because, you know, that's what people want to do. That's how they want to express themselves. That's who they are. And so certainly God would honor that. But that's not what Scripture says. You know, on that one issue alone, it says that God made people male and female in his image. And I don't want to go off on a, on a rabbit trail about all those types of different things the point of this is that we are living in a society, we're living in a culture where rather than us being willing to hear what God says about a particular issue, our tendency is to find some teacher who will affirm what we already believe or what we already think about an issue and never even go back to scripture saying, is that true or not? And even the best of us do that. Like, I found myself, you know, I, you know I, there's something that intuitively I, I think one way about it. And rather than necessarily going to scripture and studying that and pulling out the truth, I'll find a, a, a popular speaker or author, somebody who will affirm that, only to find out later, like, mm, I put too much weight in what that person's saying. I really should care more about what God says about that. And so part of the reason 
Paul tells Timothy to preach the word is you need to combat false doctrine. Well, there are a few other reasons as to why he needed to preach the word. And the second one is to equip believers. And you find uh, some evidence of that up in chapter 3 again, verse uh, 17 of chapter 3, where he said, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When we teach God's word, that prepares us to do the things that God has called us to do. You are equipped to know how to handle a particular situation. You are equipped to know how to talk about issues of faith and godliness. We are equipped to know how we should forgive or how we should love or how we should do all that he has called us to do. And so one of the reasons we teach God's word is so that you and I are prepared to go out into the world and do the entire work of the ministry. And so we are called, the, the reason why he is called to preach is to combat false doctrine, to equip believers, and the third why is to pass the baton. Now, a lot of you, mo hopefully most of you, picked up a baton as you walked in the door. I'm not going to tell you all about it just yet, but I'll give you a hint. You know, obviously this is a little bit of a hint as to what it's for. And one of the reasons why Paul wanted Timothy to preach the word is that he was ready to pass the baton. If you read verses 6 and 7 here, it says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul has finished his leg of the race that he is in. And he's saying, it's time for me to go. And it's time for you, Timothy, to pick up the baton and keep going. This echoes a lot of Paul's earlier charge to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul passing the baton to Timothy. Timothy passing the baton to reliable men. And reliable men passing the, the baton to others. That the reason we share our faith, one of the reasons we share our faith, is because we need to pass that baton to keep it going. We all are here in this room because somebody, metaphorically, passed the baton of the gospel to us. It might have been a mom or a dad or a spouse or a pastor or a friend in college or a coach or somebody else who gave you the baton of faith. But we preach the word so that we can not hold on the baton ourselves and keep it, but so that we can pass it on to somebody else. And I'm going to close with this, at least for now, is that the fourth why Timothy should preach the word is to anticipate the reward. Now, I want to be clear, we don't do it for the reward. Our reward is not our motivation, completely. 
And the crown of righteousness isn't tied exclusively to those who preach. But the reward comes to those who are faithful. Paul says here, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all those who have longed for his appearing. So he echoes back what he said there in verse 1 as his motivation for Christ's return, for Christ's judgment. He's also saying that that God is going to reward us for those of us who are faithful, for those who serve him faithfully, anticipating his return. And so it's God's promise to reward those who are faithful here. And I pray that all of us would live and serve with the end in mind. Knowing that someday Jesus is going to come back. He is going to judge each of us for what we did in this life. And he is going to set up his kingdom here. And those who are faithful, he promises to reward. And so this charge that Paul gives to Timothy is a charge to all of us. To preach the word. To do it in season and out of season. Because there will be a time when people aren't going to hear it. And we need to do it because time is short. The end is near. We have 10 minutes left. As I look at the clock. So so I'm going to end there. I'm going to come up with a song. And then before we leave, I want to close this with one final charge. So pray with me. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you love us. God, I pray for each and every one of us that we would live fully with this idea, remembering that the time is short, the end is near, and that we need to get to work. So God, help us. Use us. In your son's name's sake. Amen. Well, as we get ready to leave, you can all pull out your baton. Um, I'm not going to have you pass it around the room like I did last time I was up here. But um, you may have noticed as we were going through and all the, the reasons, the questions that were asked there. You know, we asked what and when and how and why. But there was one pretty obvious one that wasn't clearly answered in that. And that was the question of who. And I alluded to that a little bit there at the end, but clearly Paul's writing this to Timothy, and Timothy's a pastor there at Ephesus, and so, yes, this is to Timothy. But I do believe there's a broader application in all this, and that is this charge is for all of us. And then as I said before, we are all here because somebody handed us the baton of faith at one point or another. When I was in college, my first senior year, uh, my Bible study leader did this thing for the five or six of us in this Bible study where he gave us all a baton. And we wrote our favorite Bible verses on it. He said, this is for you. This is something you need to, to keep and to remember what God has done for you. He goes, but here's the catch. I don't want you to keep this baton. You need to find somebody and pass it off to them. And by God's grace, someday they will pass that baton off to somebody else. And this race of the Christian life that we are in will be this endless relay of people passing on their faith from one person to another. And so I got this really good deal on batons. <laughs> And so I decided to buy a whole bunch. And around the back of the room, there are three tables with some paint pens that I would love for you to each go back and find it 
and write your favorite Bible verse on it. (laughs) Write your name on it. I did that a couple years later when I was on staff with crew at Western Michigan University. And I led a guy to Christ. I took that baton. I gave it to him. And he led a person in this fraternity to Christ. And he gave it to him. And frankly, I don't know where that baton is right now. My prayer is someday when I get to heaven, we're going to see somebody with a baton with a whole list of names on it. And that's my prayer. That's my charge for you to take this baton, write a verse on it, write your name on it, and find somebody to pass it on. And someday, hopefully in heaven, when we get that reward for our faithfulness, we'll each find a baton with the list of names for the relay race that we started. So, so gosh, I don't know how to end that. Do that. Um, well, so do that on your way out. Go to a table, write that down. And then for the men, happy Father's Day. For those of you who are dads or soon to be dads, For granddads, we have a gift for you on your way out. I am so thankful I get to spend my Father's Day with my dad. And I know for some of us, this may not be the easiest day. Some of us might have had really cruddy dads. Um, But we get, as believers, look at it from a different perspective. We have a great Father in heaven, and he has blessed us here. So encourage another dad. Dads, again, on your way out, we have a gift for you. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Pass the baton. You're dismissed.